Why don't we just stay standing as we just pray and invite Jesus to speak into our hearts this morning. Father, we thank you that you love us and you demonstrated that love in sending your son Jesus to the earth. And we just thank you for the fact that we get to gather around your word this morning. We get to hear wonderful reports of what you're doing across the earth. And now we just open up our hearts and our lives to you, Lord, and we say, speak to us. Have your way in this place. We want to hear from you, Lord, and, and our hearts are ready to do what you speak to us about. So have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can take your seats. So good to hear about how we can play a part in sending and commissioning Pastor Bill and Kathy overseas. You know, you might not physically go, but they go representing us. And so it's a privilege to be able to send them into that place and to hear what God's been doing in and through them. Do you know, I went to my 10-year school, year, school reunion a, long, a while ago. <laughs> I won't tell you when. <laughs> um, but as I went there, I was talking to this lady and, you know, talk, you know how you go, so what are you up to? What are you doing? And you chat about these things and we're talking and I'm talking about what's happening in my life and she starts talking what's happening in her life and it was a bit weird, a bit awkward because <clears throat> halfway through she started talking, she decides to pull out some pictures and I'm thinking she's going to show me pictures of her kids, pictures of her family, you know, pictures of her... Um, I don't know, just her loved ones. And so she pulls out these pictures and then she's showing me these pictures of her yacht. <laughs> I'm going, wow, that's fantastic. Like, let me show you my pictures of my yacht. No, <laughs> it was just so awkward because it was like, I could tell that she'd brought them along wanting to impress us and show us how great her life was. And... Um, yeah, it was just, I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that. It was really interesting. <laughs> well, you might have a situation where you're talking to someone and you're thinking, they're saying something to you and you're thinking, I know that you are just exaggerating right now, that you're lying because you're wanting to just, you know, talk it up. You're wanting me to be impressed by something about your life. You know, we've all had situations like that. And this morning, I believe God is wanting to, us to grasp why Jesus said, I am the light of the world, because we can hear the fact that he said that statement, I am the light of the world, and we can think, are you just talking yourself up, Jesus? Like, are you just, you know, telling us how good you are? Um, was Jesus just some religious guru trying to make himself look better um, or trying to fool naive people into thinking he was God? Was he really into self-promotion? Like, why would he say that? Because to be honest, for someone to say, I am the light of the world, is a pretty bold statement. Like, you either have to be crazy delusional to say that, a really, really good charmer, liar person, <laughs> or it's true. Like, sometimes we can play it down, but that's a massive statement to say. So let's take a few moments to look at what was happening before Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. Because the, thing, the context helps us understand why he said it and why it's so powerful that he said it. So Jesus had just sat down to teach a crowd who'd gathered in the temple courts in Jerusalem when a woman, probably half-dressed or half-naked, was actually hauled in front of him um, because she was caught in the actual act of adultery. Now, I'm not sure where the man was, but here she was, hauled in front, standing there, made to stand in front of this group, the Pharisees, a strict religious Jewish sect, and the teachers of the law were responsible for this commotion because according to Jewish law, if you committed adultery, then you were, you, the punishment was to be stoned to death. So here we have some religious leaders feeling threatened by Jesus' popularity, feeling threatened by his miracle-working power and claims about himself trying to test Jesus. And they make this commotion. They don't actually really care about what happened to this woman. They don't really care about adhering to Jewish law and practice, but they just wanted to catch Jesus out and prove him to be, in their eyes, an imposter. After they pronounce that she's guilty and deserves stoning, they ask Jesus, what do you say? So here she is standing. There's a group. You've got to picture it. Okay? In John 8, 6, um, the motives are actually recorded for us. It says that they, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, were using this question as a trap. 
in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus stumps them completely. Because <laughs> he tells them, you know, if, you've, if, you've, if you're without sin, go for it. And then he, the one who is actually without sin, the one who was tempted in every way for us, but he's completely innocent and without sin, he actually speaks to her. And he says, Women, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. And you remember, you've got to remember this whole crowd has been watching this scene unfold. The whole crowd. So he's the pandemonium, she comes in, what they said, they walk away, the woman's standing there. The angry charges of the teachers of the law as they listed her sin and further shamed her in a public space. They watched how Jesus diffused their murderous intent and how particularly he interacted with this woman. They watched how he waited for her accusers to slowly slink away and then gently spoke with her. They witnessed with their own eyes how he lovingly bestowed on her such dignity and declared her free from shame and condemnation. And not once did they see him leer at her or, you know, look at her body. Like they didn't, they just saw his pure heart towards her. (laughs) They saw for themselves how he graciously commanded her to leave her life of sin without a trace of displeasure or disappointment in her. They saw all of this. And then, so then... Then we get to verse 12 where Jesus speaks again to this crowd who'd seen all this and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. And so understanding what happened before he said this helps us to understand he wasn't just making some self-aggrandizement statement. He wasn't just pumping himself up and saying, look how good I am. He's actually saying, this woman has had an encounter with me, the light of life. And anyone and everyone who puts their trust in me, the light of life, doesn't have to walk in darkness. They can actually leave a place of shame and darkness and despair and they can have the light of life. And so we see his heart of compassion for this woman (laughs) and his compassion for all people. He desperately wants this for all people to have and know and walk in and experience this light of life. And in the book of Isaiah, it prophesies about this, about Jesus' church. It says, arise and shine for your light has come. Deep darkness covers the earth and over the peoples, but his glory and his light shines upon you rises upon you. Nations will come to your light. He's talking about the church. And he was compelled to speak because he was testifying to what is true. It's actually true. Jesus is the light of the world. He really is. There's people in our lives who are in darkness without him. Many of us used to be in darkness, but we've been brought into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his dear son, Not just so that we can live in it and enjoy it for ourselves, but so we can compel and invite and encourage and pray for others to come too. And we need his continual light shining into our hearts and lives to see our continual need for him. In fact, (laughs) the promise of never walking in darkness is given to those who follow him. It's not a once-off prayer. It's those who follow him. It's an active, present, doing word. He doesn't promise the light of life to those who have followed him or made a once-off decision. When he spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Are you actively following Jesus? Are you actively following him? I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about putting one foot in front of the other, keeping on coming back to, realigning your heart, remembering and admitting and owning up to the fact that you need him. 
The Lord's promise to you, this is a word for some of you this morning, because the Lord's promise to you, if you are actively pursuing following Jesus, you will never walk in darkness. Some of you need to hear that today. You have the light of life. You have him in your life. And there's a promise for you that he will guide you. He will undergird you. He will sustain you. He will equip you. He will enable you as you keep following him. He will lead your life. He will shine in and through you and on you. (laughs) Because the life of a genuine Christ follower is to continually choose, to keep coming back to and continually being realigned to following Jesus. We don't graduate from this. To be a disciple is to be an apprentice to the master. I don't care how long you've been a Christian, you don't graduate from the followership of Jesus. I say all this because it's far too easy for us to slip into religion. It's far too easy for us to honour him with our lips and outward behaviour, but keep our hearts far from him. (laughs) It's far too easy for us to drift into behaviour management instead of pursuing a life of followership. It's far too easy to forget how great our God is and what it cost him to bring us into relationship with our Heavenly Father. And it's far too automatic for us to despair at the darkness and forget (laughs) about the incredible power of God for us who believe him. Incredible power of God for us who believe him. And so I want to talk about Mary of Bethany. And I want to tell you about a couple of situations in her life and how she interacted with Jesus and how she responded to him that really can teach us about how we can respond to Jesus, the light of the world, and how we need his light. The first snapshot I want to talk about is the well-known Mary and Martha story in Luke chapter 10. Martha's serving, she's busy with all the practical details. And I mean, can you imagine what it would be like to know that Jesus is coming to your house? Like, I don't know what the toilets were like back then, but you want to, we'd want them to be clean, right? You wouldn't want to have a big pile of dust sitting on the table or under the table where he's going to rest his feet. You'd want it to be looking pretty good. <laughs> So, Mary, so Martha is, you know, justifiably busy preparing to host Jesus. And so in Luke 10, we read, She, Martha, had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. She's pretty brave, bossing Jesus around. Good on you, Martha. (laughs) We do that sometimes, don't we? Come on, God. (laughs) She's not happy, Jen. She comes up to Jesus and in front of Mary and the other guests, she just berates him to get Mary to help her. But we think, when we hear this, we think, okay, she's a bit frustrated because Mary's not helping her with the washing up. Yes, okay, sure. But there's actually something going on that's, of real cultural significance as well. And the theologian N.T. Wright shares some great insights into Martha's response. He says, The problem is not simply that Mary is so starry-eyed listening to Jesus that she forgets to help with the washing up. The problem is that in that culture, men and women belong in different parts of the building. And Mary has shamelessly gone across the short but steep gulf that separates male and female space. What's more, she's assumed the posture of a disciple, a learner. She's sitting at Jesus' feet, which is the equivalent in that culture to somebody sitting at a desk in a classroom in modern Western life. You sit at the feet of a rabbi like Saul of Tarsus sitting at the feet of Gamaliel in order that one day you may be a rabbi yourself. So Martha's excuse about the washing up looks like a coded way of her saying, Stop this shameless behaviour and leave our social world intact. A bit like what Cathy was saying. You know, the social inequality that can happen where people 
black and white against each other. Jesus even speaks into those situations. There's neither slave nor free, you know. <laughs> Talks about these things, male nor female, <laughs> Greek nor Jew. We're all one in Christ. Jesus knew that both men and women are made in his image and need the light of life. That he calls men and women to follow him and black and white. <laughs> and he knows that few things are really necessary to a vital walk with him. In fact, he reduces it down to only one thing that is really necessary. And he says that's spending time sitting at the feet of Jesus. And here we see a beautiful response by Mary. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. I want to be an apprentice to the master. I want to follow you, Jesus. She chose the one thing that was really needed because she knew she needed Jesus' light to come into her life because she knew she needed Jesus more than anything. She needed his words, his guidance. She needed him. So there she was sitting at his feet. She needed him more than she needed to impress her sister or fulfill cultural expectations. And you know, for the light of the world to shine in us, we need to keep positioning ourselves at the feet of Jesus. In John 8, 12, he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. To follow him, you need to know what he says so you can do what he says. If you don't know what he says, how are you going to follow him? Do you know, this message came out of me just, God speaking to me about my devotional life. <laughs> Nailing me and saying, you need to sit at my feet. You need my word. You need to rely on me. You need to understand who I am. You need my guidance. You need me. Are you regularly humbling yourself and sitting at the feet of Jesus as a disciple? Are you opening your life up to his light? Are you letting the truth of his words penetrate your heart as you reflect on them deeply and talk with him? How we need his word. How we need to keep positioning ourselves at his feet and let his word shine a light into our hearts and lives. Of areas of darkness, areas that we need to give over to him and need to ask for his help. You know, Pastor Bill mentioned about the reading plan for 2019. Maybe an action step for you from today's message is to say, you know what, God? I want to sit at the feet of Jesus in 2019. I want to be someone who, look, I might not do it perfectly and I need your help, but God, I want to commit to doing it because this one thing is necessary in my life. It's more important than anything else to sit at the feet of Jesus. And God's speaking to you today and he's saying, I want you to prioritise your relationship with me. I want you to prioritise letting the light of his word come into your life. Is Jesus speaking to you this morning about your need to respond like Mary, to regularly and frequently sit at his feet and let the light of his word shine into your heart and life each day? For the light of the world to shine in us, we must keep positioning ourselves at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> and for the light of the world <laughs> to shine through us into dark places, you know, we must keep releasing our faith in response to his word. For the light of the world to shine into dark places, we must keep releasing our faith in response to his word. I want to talk about another situation with Mary of Bethany. In John chapter 11, we find them in a state of massive shock and grief because their brother, Lazarus, has died. And I love it that it says not only was Jesus sitting at his feet in the posture of a disciple, but in this circumstance, in the midst of her grief and her despair and her desperation, we find her once again 
flinging herself down at Jesus' feet. Because it says in John eleven thirty two, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> and Martha and Mary both say this to Jesus. Lord, we needed you and you weren't here. And how often do we say that? in situations that we face. I'm sure many of us have at one time or another when there's suffering we can't understand our natural human response is to despair. Maybe you're facing something right now. There's some stuff going down in your family at Christmas time or there's stuff going down in your work situation. There's just a dark situation that you're wrestling with and you're thinking, what is going on? Do you know, when we're going through this, we're vulnerable to lies that God doesn't really care. And if he did, he would have and should have stopped it or stepped in to intervene. But there was stuff that was happening that Jesus wanted to do in this situation that Mary and Martha couldn't see. They thought he just wanted, they they thought he should have just healed Lazarus. But Jesus didn't want to just heal Lazarus because he knew physically he was going to die again one day. He actually wanted to reveal who he is, the resurrection and the life. He wanted to reveal that he has complete power and authority over sin and sickness and death. And that anyone who puts their trust in him will not die spiritually, but will have eternal life with him forever. He wanted to do something far bigger and greater than what they could see. I love it that Mary threw herself at Jesus' feet. Some of you today, you need to throw yourself at Jesus' feet, you know. She didn't run from him in her despair. She ran to him. She had so many questions and was overcome by grief, but she brought all her feelings and despair to Jesus. And, you know, for some of you this morning, you need to hear this. Kathy preempted what I said. Jesus can handle our intense emotions. He can handle them. He's not shocked by our questions. He wants us to run to him and cling to him when we're at the end of ourselves and can't make sense of things. He wants us to honestly pour out our hearts to him even when we feel in despair. Mary of Bethany took her despair to Jesus and we see Jesus' beautiful response. He identifies with her and her sister's pain and his heart of compassion goes out to her. You know, some of the times when there's been a human tendency to despair and I feel like the Holy Spirit has helped me, enabled me to just throw myself at Jesus' feet. I don't always have a sense of, wow, everything's going to change and be hunky-dory, but I have a sense of God's presence right there in the midst with me, assuring me that he's got this, that he's in control that I don't have to try and manufacture things and work it all out and control the situation, but just at his feet, just knowing that he's got this, that he's in control, that he loves me, that he's going to work good in this situation, he's going to bring good out of it, is enough. Some of you can receive that precious gift today of an awareness, a deepening awareness of his presence instead of holding yourself at arm's distance from him, running to him and saying, Jesus, I'm desperate, I need you to be assured and comforted by his beautiful presence. Because his heart of compassion goes out to you today and his heart of compassion, his own grief welled up inside of him in empathy with these dear sisters. He tells them to do something that is quite astounding. (laughs) He actually... First of all, he cries with them. The shortest verse in the Bible is John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Isn't that an encouraging scripture to know that Jesus weeps with you if you're going through suffering? He weeps with you. Jesus wept. And then his anger and his frustration and his distaste for sin and suffering and death and sickness rises up in him and he's like, take me, where have you put him? <laughs> He tells them to take away the stone in front of where Lazarus was buried because he wants to let the light of his power and glory shine upon this situation in ways they could never have imagined. All for the glory of God. I want you to think about that for a minute because what he asks them to do is astounding. It takes 
faith. He asked them to remove the stone. Lazarus has been dead for four days. It's not going to smell that great when they remove the stone. And the Jews had a belief that for three days, the spirit of a person would hover over and around their body, but by the fourth day, it had gone. So in their mind, they're thinking, there's no way. I don't even care if we remove the stone, Jesus. This is an impossibility. This situation cannot be retrieved. This, this is gone. This is dead and buried. This is done. But Jesus says, take away the stone. And he says to them, did, not, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? He's asking them to risk embarrassment, social awkwardness, dishonoring their brother, the possibility that things might not work out. He's asking them to trust him more than they can understand what might be happening. And so Martha understandably rejects, Lord, there'll be a smell. (laughs) And that's when Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. They face this choice. Do they trust that Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do? Or do they continue on in despair? Do they trust that Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he said he can do? Or do they continue on in despair? In response to Jesus' clear directive, they choose to exercise faith. They, didn't, they, could, have, they could have just stood there and think, all right, Jesus, you can miraculously move the stone, but that's not what happens. He said to them, remove the stone. They actually had to do something and release their faith for the light of his miracle working power to shine into that dark place. And it's the same that is true for us today in dark situations. There might be someone who think, they are never going to come to know Jesus in my family. Who told you that? He can reach into the blackest heart. He can move into the darkest situation. Nothing could hold him down. He's risen from the dead. He's alive. He can do anything he wants. And he wants people to come to know him and people to experience him personally. So I just feel today, you know, (laughs) we need to remove some stones of unbelief, some stones of doubt, some stones of despair, and actually look again at Jesus, the risen one, the one who paid the price and took the punishment and the penalty for all of our sin, the one who did everything possible to remove the barrier between us and God, the one we sang about this morning, who chose the nails to go... Go through that for us, for you. Not just so that you could be forgiven, but also so you could have God's perfect record and could be adopted into his family, so you could know God as your father, so you could have eternal life. He's the one who poured out the Holy Spirit. He's the one who's seated on the throne. I don't know what dark situation you're facing. But you think about it, you walk into a room and you can't just wish the light to come on. I know there's Google house, whatever that says, Google, turn the lights on. I get that, right? That's technology. But I'm just saying, physically, you cannot wish for the light to come on and through your mental powers or through your speaking like God did. Let there be light and the room just comes on wherever you go. You actually have to what? Flicker, switch. And that's what faith is like. Faith is like flicking a switch to say, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand how this can change. I don't even understand how you're going to work. But I choose to look to you. I choose to release my faith that you are good and that you can do anything. I choose to believe that your light can shine into this situation that seems impossible. So we're going to do that. We're going to choose to believe that together. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you come to us and you, through speaking your word, faith comes by hearing the word. And you speak your word to inspire faith so that we might reach out and receive all that you have for us. And I thank you, Lord, that today you're speaking 
faith and you're speaking your promise into situations and you're inspiring us to not look at what the impossibility is, to not look at the stone that's in front of that thing, to not look at the impossibility of that situation, but to look again at Jesus, the one who's risen from the dead, to look again at you who can do anything, to release our faith in the God who said, let there be light and who has made us understand that the light of His gospel is in the face of Jesus.